take that out, we can keep it on. What does that do? To brighten the colour. Oh. So with that, it's going to give you that little bit of thing to it where it's, it's not fully obviously it's ready on there. But we'll see if we put it on. Yeah. But that might be okay. Yes. You can't. You just wait.
peace and blessings upon our master Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam upon his blessed family, his loyal companions and all of those who followed after with excellence up until the day of standing Ameen, Ameen, Ameen Thereafter Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi radiallahu an he said in the fifth chapter Babu ma jaa fi shaybi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam what has been narrated concerning the blessed white hairs of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam so in the previous chapter the Shaykh was speaking about uh, he spoke about the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then he spoke about the combing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now he's dedicating a chapter to the white the blessed white hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam so what do we notice here? We notice that Imam Tirmidhi, who was from the very early scholars of Hadith, he was a student of Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim. And he was from the very early scholars of Hadith, how he is dedicating particular chapters to every portion of matter that we can speak about regarding the blessed hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Somebody could have said, he could have combined all of these ahadith in a single chapter. And he could have said, the blessed hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Within that, he could have spoke about the combing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He could have spoke about the blessed white hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He could have spoke about the dying of the blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he divided them up into four chapters. What does this teach all of us? that the early scholars of hadith gave considerable amount of attention to every portion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and within every portion they divided up the different parts into particular chapters this is an indication to all of us as to how much concern and how much detail the very early scholars of hadith gave to the person of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is this is our heritage this is our religion this is the teachings that our teachers uh, gave us with an unbroken chain of narration that everything about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam must be studied looked at in extreme detail things there's nothing that's overlapping everything is in its place so we have to notice uh, the chapterization of Imam At-Tirmidhi radiallahu an. For example, his teacher, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari radiallahu an, the names of the chapters of Sahih Al-Bukhari, just the names, scholars after him wrote entire works just on figuring out why he gave particular titles to particular chapters. They, uh, they worked out a link between the naming of the chapters uh, with the chapter before it and the chapter after it and the, the organization of their works was very meticulous. Uh, when studying the, the, cha the names of the chapters of the early books of hadith scholars dedicated a lot of time and a lot of work just to understand why the scholar of hadith named this chapter like this and for all of us we need to pick up on these very important matters that were not placed there just out of coincidence no they were placed there very meticulously and very carefully was uh, were these books compiled so imam tirmidhi radiallahu an he has an entire chapter on the blessed hair of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the co uh, the another chapter on the combing of the hair of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam another chapter on the blessed white hairs of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam another chapter on uh, when he dyed his blessed hair or whether he dyed his blessed hair or not sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's four chapters so we have to pick up this notion of a deep attachment onto the person of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that these early, very early scholars of hadith have. And why I'm mentioning this very particularly that they were very early scholars of hadith because a lot of people 
out there, they make, they, they want to give this idea that such deep attachment onto the Prophet ﷺ is something that came about very late on in, in Islamic history. No, it didn't. It was as early as Imam al-Bukhari. And not, and we don't stop there. If we go back to the Sahaba, you find the Tabi'i Qatada asking Sayyidina Anas, كَيْفَ كَانَ شَعْرُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ How was the hair of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now who would ask about the hair? But they gave particular attention to every part of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because this is part of our religion. The Messenger of Allah, his entire being, his noble body, his blessed person is the essence of our religion. This is why he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, none of you can have faith until I am not more beloved unto you than your parents, your children, and all people of this world. Until he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam isn't more beloved, our iman is not complete. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Messenger of Allah, I love you more than everybody except myself. He was honest. He was truthful. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, Not yet Umar, i.e. your Iman is not yet complete. So Sayyidina Umar, he stood back and he contemplated with himself and he made the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dominate over his person for his love for his own self. And he said, Messenger of Allah, now I love you more than myself. Now I love you, even then, my, more than my own self. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, An al -an ya Umar. Now your time has come. Now you have perfect Iman. So, we, we take our religion from the likes of Imam Tirmizi radiallahu an, from the likes of his teacher, Imam al-Bukhari radiallahu an, and it's extremely important that we turn back to these original sources of our religion, so that we can understand our religion very clearly and when and if people uh, make accusations that so much of our practice of the religion came later on and perhaps even uh, highlighted as innovation then we can clearly say this is not of innovation if Imam al-Bukhari was doing it this is not of innovation if Imam al-Tirmidhi was writing it in his book so he said, Babu ma jaa fi shaybi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What has been narrated concerning the blessed white hairs of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the first narration, An qatada taqala qultu li anas ibn Malikin, hal khadaba Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qala lam yablugh thalik, inna ma kana shayban fi sudghayh. ولكن أبو بكر رضي الله عنه خضب بالحناء والكتم قتادة رضي الله عن أسد سيدنا أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه he said did the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم dye his blessed hair and سيدنا أنس responded and said لم يبلغ ذلك the blessed hair of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't reach a stage whereby he needed to dye his hair when is it that a person needs to dye the hair? It's when the hair goes white, that's when the hair is dyed. Otherwise, if it's in its natural color, there's no need to dye the hair. So Anas radiallahu anh said, Lam yablugh dhalik. He didn't reach a stage sallallahu alayhi wa whereby he needed to dye his blessed hair. Innama kana shayban fi sudghayhi. Rather, he had some whiteness in his temples, i.e. in the sides uh, of his noble head, he had some whiteness here, whereas the rest of the uh, blessed head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his noble hair stayed in their original color of black. And we mentioned some of the wisdoms and reasons behind that in the previous lesson. Then he said, وَلَكِنْ أَبُوْ بَكَرٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ خَضَبَ بِالْحِنَّاءِ وَالْكَتَمْ But rather Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه, he dyed his blessed hair with hinna and we'll cut up with katam with hinna and we'll with katam now sayyidina anas radiyallahu an why did he mention sayyidina abu bakr he was asked whether the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam dyed his hair or not 
Why did he answer and then add on that Sayyidina Abu Bakr dyed his hair? The reason behind this was to indicate to Qatada, even though the Prophet ﷺ didn't need to dye his blessed hair, even though he didn't need to dye his blessed hair, he still approved of his companions dyeing their hair. Therefore, it is a sunnah through approval. It is a sunnah through approval. Because the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is anything that the Prophet ﷺ said, anything that he did, and anything that he approved to, whether he did it himself or not, he approved to it, he saw his companions do it, and he accepted it, that also constitutes a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ through approval. Is that clear? And some of the scholars have added on a fourth point regarding the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is uh, his characteristics and his shama'il are also part of his noble sunnah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so most scholars mention three things his sayings his actions his approvals some scholars added on a fourth which is his characteristics also constitute his noble sunnah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the next narration uh, so in this hadith he said hinna and katam katam is a reddish colored plant used as a dye Imam Ibn Hajar mentioned in Fathul Bari, he said, pure katam brings about black color with some redness within it. And hinna brings about red. So he used both to achieve a color in between black and red. The next narration, An Anas ibn Malikin, qala ma adattu fi ra'su rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama wa lihyatihi Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhi said I did not count in the noble head of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his blessed beard more than 14 except 14 white hairs except 14 white hairs remember when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived to Madinatul Munawwara Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik was only 10 years of age. His mother, Um Sulaim, radiallahu anha, took him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ibni hadha yakhdimuk. This son of mine will serve you. Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik was a servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Khadamtu Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ashra sinin. I served the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 10 years. Which means he was always in and out of the blessed house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He would do chores for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he would help out in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he was always in very close proximity to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he had a greater opportunity to actually be able to count the blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for this reason and for the fact that he was extremely young. And young children, they tend to notice much more uh, than adults. And they observe much more than adults. And they don't, have, uh, they don't have this tendency of perhaps shyness, where an adult might uh, tend to feel shy, where a child won't feel that because of the innocence of a child, because of the purity of a child, wanting to learn through observation. Wanting to learn through observation. This is why it's extremely important that we, uh, we, we work on our children whilst they are young. We teach and nurture our children whilst they are young. Like the Arabic proverb says, Al-Hifzu fi sigari kan naqshi fil hajari Memorization in childhood is like carving into a stone. It never leaves, right? And the early, the early people of Islam, they would make their very young children attend uh, gatherings of hadith. Attend gatherings of hadith. Why? So that they take from the blessings of the recitation of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Perhaps they were not even at an age where, whereby 
they could comprehend and understand what was being delivered, yet they would pick up from the blessings of the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they would also observe how people attend with tranquility and peace. People, students study and engage in learning. When children observe this from a young age, uh, it's something that they would want to yearn for. It's something that they would remember. And in the, in the gatherings of Imam al-Bukhari radiallahu anh, there would be children attending also. And one of those children was actually, when he grew up, he was, he was the only surviving narrator of Sahih al-Bukhari. He was an adult, but he was the only surviving narrator of Sahih al-Bukhari who attended the gathering of Imam al-Bukhari radiallahu anh, whilst he was a child. So the scholars of Hadith went to him and said, we're going to sit and recite Sahih al-Bukhari to you because you heard it directly from Imam al-Bukhari even though you were a child. Even though you were a child. And Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin radiallahu an, he mentions in his commentary on the Bayquniyah, uh, on a text of uh, the Bayquniyah is a famous poem written in the science of hadith. In that, he, uh, on the commentary on that, Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin mentions, he says, uh, age is not a requisite, is, is not a prerequisite for a person to be a narrator of hadith. Age is not a prerequisite. He said, there may be a 50 year old whose narration of hadith is not, not accepted, whilst there might be a 5 year old whose narration of hadith is accepted. He said, there may be a 50 year old whose hadith narration is not accepted, whilst there may be a 5 year old whose hadith narration is accepted. And then he gives the example of a companion whose name was Mahmud ibn al-Rabi' radiyallahu an. Mahmud ibn al-Rabi' radiyallahu an, he said, Majja Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama fi wajhi, fi wajhi, fi wajhi, fi wajhi majjatan wa anabnu khamsi sinin. He said, Mahmud ibn al-Rabi' radiyallahu an said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam poured out from his blessed mouth and sprayed into my face water whilst I was a five-year-old child. So the Prophet ﷺ had some water in his blessed mouth and he saw this child Mahmoud, Mahmoud ibn al-Rabi' and he sprayed out that water into the mouth, into the face of this child. Mahmoud ibn al-Rabi' when he grew up, he would narrate this narration. But when did he receive the narration? when he was a five-year-old child. Likewise, Sayyiduna al-Hasan ibn Ali radiallahu an, the grandchild of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, حَفِظْتُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam دَعْ مَا يَرِيبُكَ إِلَى مَا لَا يَرِيبُكَ Sayyiduna al-Hasan radiallahu an said, I memorized from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the following hadith. And what was that? دَعْ مَا يَرِيبُكَ إِلَى مَا لَا يَرِيبُكَ Leave that which gives you doubt to that which doesn't give you doubt. Now the question is, how old was Sayyiduna Hassan radiallahu an when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left this world? Sayyiduna Hassan was eight years old. His brother Sayyiduna al Hussein was seven years old. Later on in life, Sayyiduna al Hassan is narrating what he memorized from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for sure before the age of eight, which means. He was actively learning from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his childhood. So it's very important that we engage our children uh, in, in learning from a young age. We, we, we engage them in loving books. Uh, my teacher, Shaykh Riyad Al-Khiraqi, Rahmatullahi Ali, the Shaheed, the great scholar of Hadith, when we would study uh, in his house, the commentary of Nukhbatul Fikr by Imam Ibn Hajar Asqalani radiallahu an Friday mornings before Jumu'ah uh, his children who were very young they, they, they would they would learn the names of the enormous books of hadith that were around in his, in his house his entire apartment was a library literally without any exaggeration I didn't go to, into his kitchen, but I believe even in his, in, in his kitchen, there would have been books. The, we didn't ever see plaster on his walls. All we saw that they were plastered with books from top to bottom, 
right? One day, Shaykh Riyadh Rahmatullah Ali, he said to us, he said, somebody came to my house one day and said to me, Shaykh, why don't you cover these bookshelves with beautiful glass, uh, you know, uh, glass doors? And Shaykh Riyadh said, I just smiled at the person and I didn't say anything to him. And he said to us, he said, well, you guys know why I can't put glass, uh, glass doors on these, uh, on these book cupboards because every single day, most of these books, they come down and they are opened and hadith is researched and they go back so many times a day. That's one of the reasons. And the other reason is that his ch very young children, they would climb up the shelves. And I remember very, very clearly his very young child who was probably about three or four years old. And he said, he pointed at a book and he said, Tabawani, which is Tabarani. He said, Tabawani. And he was only three or four years of age, right? Uh, this is something which is extremely important for all of us. We live in a very difficult time, a very troubling time. We have to return back to our religion and to the study of our religion. And we have to really make our children love the study of this religion. We have to make them love the study of this religion. And Shaykh Riyadh al-Khiraqi told us of one of the teachers of Imam Muslim عن, when he would go to study, uh, he would take his young child with him. And that young child, he would make him carry two large stones, one in either hand. And he would walk and walk and walk. And when the son would say, Dad, I'm tired, his father would say, drop one of the stones. So he'd drop them. He'd walk and walk and walk and the son would say, Dad, I'm tired. He'd say, drop the other one. He'd walk and walk and walk and the son would say, Dad, I'm totally shattered now. And he, he would say, carry on. Somebody asked him, why do you make him carry two stones? And why do you make him walk for such long distances? He said, so he realizes the value of what he's going to receive. So he realized the value of what he's going to receive. Shaykh Riyadh al-Khiraqi he used to say to us, he used to say, if you live close by to the school that we are studying at, he used to say, if you live close by, then try to walk. If you live far away, then try to, uh, try to jump off the bus a few bus stops early and walk to school. Because when you walk, uh, you will have a greater realization of uh, and a greater value of what you're going to study because you would have exhausted your body and put in that effort. So it's very important. Look at Imam Shafi'i radiallahu an. He was an orphan. He was born in Gaza. His mother took him from Palestine all the way to Makkah al-Mukarramah and he, she sat him in, in the gatherings of some of the greatest scholars of Makkah al-Mukarramah. And he was a very young child. And then she took him after studying after he's, he studied in Mecca, she took him to Medina al Munawwara and he sat in the gatherings of hadith of Imam Malik radiallahu an, as a very young child. And Imam Shafi'i radiallahu an, he had a photographic memory. And when he would sit in the gatherings of Imam Malik, he would sit like this. He would take out his hand, his left hand, and with his right hand, he would pretend that he was, his index finger was a pen and he would write on his left hand. Without ink, without paper, he would just write on his left hand. One day Imam Malik noticed this young boy sitting there with his index finger writing on his left hand. And he said to him, boy, what are you doing? Uh, you should be writing so you memorize. You should be writing so you know. And Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, he said, he said, I've memorized every single hadith that you've recited. First hand. So Imam Malik said to him, recite. And the boy, he just recited from the top of his head. He recited from the top of his head. So it's extremely important. Uh, like the mother of Sayyidina Anas, radiallahu an, we become parents like that. That we want our children in the gatherings of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when we instill this in them from a young age, when we sow the seeds of loving the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his gatherings of learning and knowledge, from a young age, then they will become the blossoming flowers of Islam. They will become the fragrant flowers of Islam who will give our eyes comfort and, uh, and who will bring a beautiful fragrance into people that will purify hearts and rectify minds. So we have to give 
a lot of concern to this matter that we shouldn't only attend ourselves, we should bring our children. And we should bring them to the, to the masajid, bring them to uh, the gatherings of learning. Because at a young age, when they attend gatherings like this, their, their hearts will be filled with, with blessings. They are innocent children. They, they, are, they are like sponges. They, they observe, they absorb, they take in. And if they can do this from a young age, like Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu an, we all say, only if I was in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This, everybody would wish for this. But like the great muhaddis of Sham, Shaykh Nuruddin Itar rahmatullah alayhi, uh, he wrote at the end of one of his works, he said, I didn't, uh, I didn't put effort in studying hadith so that I can have uh, honor and uh, so that I can have prestige and collect uh, certificates. He said, rather, I put all of this effort in studying hadith so that I can hear the words of my beloved if I missed out on seeing him. He said, if I missed out on seeing him, I don't want to miss out on hearing his blessed words, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So uh, we have to follow in the footsteps of the mada of Sayyidina Anas and in the footsteps of Sayyidina Anas radiallahu an. He said, I did not count in the blessed head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his blessed beard, uh, except 14 white hairs. In other narrations, Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anh said 17, 18 and 20 hairs. So, and he did not go beyond 20. 20 was the maximum that he mentioned. So it's possible that at times he missed certain hairs and at other times he counted them out also. The next narration قال سمعت جامر بن سمرة وقد سئل عن شيب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال كان إذا دهن رأسه لم يرى منه شيء شيب وإذا لم يدهن رؤيا منه سماك بن حرب said I heard جامر بن سمرة and he had been questioned or asked about the white blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said when he would apply oil his blessed hair when he would apply oil to his blessed hair no white hairs could be seen and when he would not apply oil to his blessed hair they could be seen so it's possible that a companion would have seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and not noticed a single white hair and when was that? When he would apply oil to his blessed hair, none of the white hair would be seen. And if he didn't apply oil, then the white hair could be seen. And that's natural. When oil is applied, uh, the, the white hairs, they tend to hide away. And when, when the hair is dry, uh, i.e. there's no oil applied to it, then the white hairs become more apparent. The next narration on Abdullah ibn Umar. An Nafi'in an Abdullah ibn Umar. In hadith studies, chains of narration from Nafi' an Abdullah ibn Umar. Nafi' was a tabi'i and he was a student of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar. This chain is from the best chains in hadith studies. It's from the best of narrations in hadith studies. So Nafi' narrates from his teacher, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Umar. And again, like Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik, Abdullah ibn Umar was also a very young lad in the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was also a very young boy in the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his father, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an would bring him to the gatherings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that he could directly learn and observe from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what has been narrated about Abdullah ibn Umar is he had a very deep attachment and a close affiliation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was from amongst the companions who would carry the blessed sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he had a very close attachment to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and we see after the Prophet ﷺ left this world, all of the companions were extremely devastated, and especially the young of them. And amongst them was Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. He was extremely devastated. And to remind himself of those days and moments of the Prophet ﷺ, he would walk over to the blessed member of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, and he would wipe his hands on the place where the Prophet ﷺ would sat, sit, and then he would wipe his hands over his face. And he, he would wipe his hands over the member and place them on his face. Why? To seek blessings from the place where the Prophet ﷺ sat. And amongst the companions, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar was known to be of those companions who were extremely adherent to every one of the sunnas of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He tried not to miss out any of the blessed sunnas of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, إِنَّمَا كَانَ شَيْبُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ نَحْوًا مِنْ عِشْرِينَ شَعْرَةً بَيْضًا Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar said, the blessed white hairs of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were only around 20 or so in number. So very similar to what Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik said, only about 20 hairs. Now, Imam al-Tirmizi has already mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had 20 white hairs. Why is he repeating this again? He's repeating this again to teach us something. It's not a coincidence, number one. Number two, it's not a repetition. So what is it? It's a lesson that Imam al-Tirmidhi is teaching us that it wasn't only Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik who was walking in and out of the house of the Prophet Sallallahu serving him who knew the number of the white hairs of the Prophet Sallallahu it was other companions who also knew this number and there were other companions who were also very meticulous in counting those blessed white hairs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so this type of attachment was widespread amongst the companions and it's not confined to one or two of them. Perhaps we only find narrations from one or two of them who are the younger of the companions because they were much more observant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whereas the elder companions, they would not raise their sight towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out of awe of his majesty Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like Sayyiduna uh, Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu said from the day that I accepted Islam till the end of my life he said I never raised my sight and filled my eyes with seeing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam out of his awe and his majesty sallallahu alayhi wasallam they wouldn't raise their eyes towards him whereas young people they are more observant so Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar also uh, said that there were no more than 20 or so white hairs uh, in the blessed beard and head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next narration, an, an ibn Abbas, the next narration is from Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is also a young lad in the days of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So tell me, what are we seeing here? We are seeing... Hadith is being narrated by young people. Hadith is being narrated by young companions who were young in the days of the Prophet ﷺ and they were young at the time when he ﷺ left this world. Which means what? That there were young people in the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ studying, learning and observing and then later on they delivered this religion to the people who came after them. And that's an important lesson for all of us, that we should take heed of our youth, our, of our young days, and study and learn so that we can pass on this religion to the people who come after us. When I say the people who come after us, that means the youngsters who are younger than us and growing up before our eyes, it is our duty and it is our responsibility that we pass on this religion to them. So Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's cousin. His father was Sayyidina Al-Abbas 
the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam loved this uncle of his uh, a lot. One day, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, "A'jabani Jamal wa Ammin Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam." He said, "I've been amazed." The Prophet said to his uncle, "I'm amazed at the Prophet's uncle's beauty." Look, look at the, the wording of the Prophet He didn't say, uncle, I'm amazed at your beauty. He said, I'm amazed at the Prophet's uncle's beauty. Why did he say it like that? Because he wanted to relate his uncle back to prophethood. And not a mere relationship of uncle and nephew. But rather, from the station of prophethood, he said, I love your beauty. And his uncle Sayyidina al-Abbas said, Mal Jamal. Which beauty is it that you are speaking about Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Al-Lisan, your tongue Because Sayyidina Al-Abbas, he was very eloquent And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he loved eloquency He loved people who spoke well And he disliked people making faults and errors in, in speech he loved people who spoke well and who were eloquent in their speech. Uh, one day Sayyidina al-Abbas radiallahu anh, said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Messenger of Allah, uh, if you give me permission, I would like to say a poem in praise of you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said to him, Qul la yafladillahu faak. Say, may Allah never let your mouth to rot. May Allah never let your mouth to rot. And this is one of the du'as that the Prophet ﷺ would make for those people who said poems for him and wrote na'ats for him. And the other was that Allah illuminates their faces. So Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, he was only 13 years old when the Prophet ﷺ left this world. But in, though, in that very young tender age, he had a lot of appreciation for who the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was, to such an extent that Imam al Bukhari radiallahu anh, narrates that one day he came to stay in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He wanted a sleepover in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? To notice how the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sleeps and how he wakes up and what he does at night sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A young, a young child of the younger than the age of thirteen. And he wants to observe so much about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So much. And then he informs us, he says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam slept. And then he woke up during the night. He performed his wudu. He used his miswak. And he stood up for tahajjud, the night prayer. And Sayyidina Abdullah said, and I stood beside him. And I stood to his left side. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lovingly gra grabbed me from my ear and he turned me to the right side. Right? So we wouldn't have perhaps known this observation or this detail of this observation of the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at night if it wasn't for Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas who had this thought that I should do this. So our young children, they should not only be studying, learning, but they should be so intrigued to know about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So intrigued that they want to know everything about him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Qala Abu Bakrin, Ya Rasulallah, Qad Shibta. Qala Shayyibatni Hudun, Wal Waqi'atu, Wal Mursalatu, Wa Amma Yatasa'aloon, Wa Idha Shamsu Kubwirat. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, Sayyidina Abu Bakr as siddiq radiallahu an said, O Messenger of Allah, qad shibta. O Messenger of Allah, your hair has become white. Because remember, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was a few years younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he lived his entire life with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he's always noticing a black beard. And suddenly he notices that some of the hairs in the blessed beard of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam have gone white. So he said, Qad shibta ya Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, your hair is going white. What was the response of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, Shayyabatni hudun. He said, the chapters 
in the Quran, the chapter of Hud, Waqi'ah, Mursalat, Amma Yatasa'alun, and Iza Shamsu Kubwirat have turned my hair white. Allahu Akbar. What does that mean? Some people, their hair goes white due to aging. Other people, their hair goes white due to anxiety and worries. Other people, their hair goes white due to a lack of nutrition that reaches the hairs. These are all reasons why we know people's hair goes white. These are some of the reasons. But why did the hair of the Prophet ﷺ go white? It wasn't because of aging. It wasn't because of any type of anxiety or depression. It wasn't because of a lack of nutrition that was reaching his hair. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed equal amount of nutrition in all of the particles of the blessed body of the Prophet ﷺ, such that they had full strength till the end of his blessed life. So why was it that his hair went white? The Prophet ﷺ said, verses within these chapters, when I recited them, they frightened me so much that my hair went white. That my hair went white. What do we understand of that? We understand that the Prophet ﷺ, when he would recite the Quran, the meanings of the Quran and the examples within the Quran of the punishment that Allah sent upon the previous nations. Those examples, when he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would read them, they would frighten him. They would scare him. They would send a vibe through him which would cause his blessed hair to go white. What does this mean? That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when reciting the Quran, he wasn't passive. His mind was actively engaging in all of the meanings. His mind was actively engaging in what was happening. Because there's a lot of scenery in the Quran al kareem There's a lot of scenery in the Quran al kareem Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions in detail punishments that he sent upon previous nations because of the sins, disobediences, and because of how they denied and disbelieved in their prophets and messengers, and how they mocked and abused and insulted their prophets and messengers, and Allah sent upon them punishment. When the Prophet ﷺ would read about that punishment, he would be frightened, he would be scared. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, when you recite the Qur'an, cry. فَإِن لَمْ تَبْكُوا فَتَبَاكُوا And if you can't cry whilst reciting the Qur'an, then try to cry. Force yourself to cry. Make yourself cry when reciting the Qur'an. Why? Because the Qur'an is very heavy. It's very majestic. It's very... Uh, powerful it's overpowering it's overwhelming now this is an account of the Prophet sallallahu that when he would recite these particular surahs they would cause his hair to go white that's an understanding that we need to take back with ourselves and we need to go back and recite these particular surahs and look within these surahs, what portions are there within these surahs that would have frightened the Prophet ﷺ? In one narration, the Sahaba said, The Prophet ﷺ, every time he would pass by a verse in which Allah would mention punishment, he would seek refuge in Allah. Who, who is seeking refuge in Allah? The one who is sinless, the one who is infallible, the one who is pure, the one who came to purify, the one upon whose heart the Qur'an 
was revealed, the one who is the leader of the prophets and messengers, he would seek refuge in Allah from that punishment. He would ask Allah for protection from that punishment. What does that mean? That means that the Prophet وسلم, was in a very big state of awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was in a very big state of awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though he was the most beloved unto Allah, he was also the most fearing of Allah. He was the most conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means what? That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's love, his love, for example, some people they may love, I'm speaking other than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some people they may love, but it might be that their love makes them transgress. What does that mean? That they don't have a balance between love and fear. They don't have a balance between love and fear. For example, everybody loves their parents. But there might be somebody who because of that love, they think they can transgress. They think that they can do wrong. Why? Because they don't have that same level of fear. They don't have that same level of fear. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala placed within him love for his majesty, i.e. Allah, but also placed within his heart fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means that when he would pass by these verses of punishment, he would be frightened, he would be scared, and he would seek Allah's forgiveness and protection and refuge. And this is a lesson for all of us. We may pass by verses of punishment and subconsciously or consciously think what? Now, these are not for me anyway. These are for the disbelievers. These are for the people who went before us. We're the saved nation. We're this, we're that. We may think like this. But not like that should we be reciting the Quran. We should be reciting it as he sallallahu alayhi wa recited it. Which means every verse of punishment that he passed is ta'az. He sought refuge in Allah from that punishment. Also, the opposite, وَكُلَّمَا مَرَّ بِآيَةِ رَحْمَةٍ Every time he passed by a verse in which Allah speaks about mercy, Allah speaks about forgiveness, he, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam would ask Allah for his mercy, ask Allah for his forgiveness. So what do we see? We see a balance in the approach of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam towards the Qur'an al-Kareem. Look, the Qur'an, he, it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, and he is sinless, he is infallible. Why did he have to worry about the verses of punishment in the Qur'an? Because he understands and realizes the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that before Allah's majesty, nobody can stand. Before Allah's greatness, nobody can stand. And before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody has a standing. Because Allah is the bestower, He is the giver, He is the provider, He is the creator, and He is the ultimate master before, who, before whom? Before whom? Every creation is in servitude. So a servant must be fearful of the master, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next narration, and in, in the commentary on the side, uh, from each of these surahs, uh, there are verses that have been mentioned which indicate those very heavy meanings uh, through which the Prophet ﷺ would feel this fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty The next narration an Abi Juhayfa taqal qalu ya Rasulullah naraka qad shibta 
قال قد شيبتني هود واخواتها ابو جحيفه said they said i the companions of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qad shibta messenger of allah your hair is going white and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said shayyabatni hud wa akhawatuha hud and its sisters ay hud surah hud and its sister surahs have made me go white what do people of, what do we hear from the people of the world the worries and anxieties and troubles of life have made me age made me go white have done this to me and have done that to me the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said it's these verses of the quran that have made my hair go white which means his relationship with the quran was very close very deep very heavy and i say for the believing people to have love for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's important that they become people of the quran why when you love you love with your heart and you want that love of your heart to fall into somebody else's heart and what was in the heart of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nazala bihi ar-ruh al-amin ala qalbik allah said the quran was revealed to his blessed heart so if his heart was to be opened up we would find the quran al-karim in his heart which means that if we open up the chapters of the quran we have actually entered into the blessed heart of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we should make it a habit of opening the quran reciting the quran contemplating the meanings of the quran and engaging in the quran with with this state of 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 huzn sorrow the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed us to recite the quran with huzn with sorrow with a brokenness with a humility with uh, with uh, with a mind that's reflecting with tadabbur allah said in the quran afala yatadabbaruna alqur'ana am ala qulubin aqfaluha do they not contemplate the quran or is it that their hearts have been locked and if we feel that our hearts are locked then we have to start unlocking our hearts and how do we unlock our hearts then we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up our hearts that we open up the quran and we try to engage with it and we make sincere dua and have a relationship with the quran al karim because one of the things that will stand up for a person in the grave is the quran the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when the believing person is laid in the grave two things will stand up his fasting and his quran his fasting will say oh allah this person deprived himself of food and drink throughout the day in ramadan so i intercede for him before you and the quran will say oh allah this person will would stand in the depths of the night depriving himself of sleep reciting me so i ask you to intercede to accept my intercession for him so we have to have a relationship with the quran that we recite the quran and contemplate its meanings uh, because that's the book that allah sent for us and it's it's the miraculous book that spoke about that spoke about affairs and uh, incidences that would happen in the future and they happen exact and what is to yet happen is mentioned in the quran al karim this is why the whole world is fearing what the quran has prophesized what what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has prophesized of the future because they know everything else of it has come true and what's to come will also come true they get all of their strengths together to try to uh, attack it and to undermine it and make its promises not come true but allah says wallahu mutimmu nurihi and allah is the completer of his light and nobody can blow out his light because allahu nuru as-samawati wal ard Allah is the creator of the light of the heavens and the earth. In the next narration, an Abi Rimsata At-Taymi, Taymi Taymi Rabab qaal, ataytu an-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ma'i ibn li qaala fa arayituhu fa qultu lamma ra'aytuhu hadha nabiyullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi thawbani akhdaran 
وله شعر وقد علاه الشيب وشيبه أحمر Abu Rimsah At-Taymi from, from Taym of Ribab Taym of Ribab Mulla Ali Al-Qari Al-Hanafi radiyallahu anna uh, notes that's that there were two types of Taym one was Taym of Ribab and one was Taym of Quraysh Taym of Ribab consisted of five tribes So Abu Rimsa, who reported, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whilst one of my sons was with me. I saw, I was shown the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it was as if perhaps this was the first time he came to the gathering. He said, I was shown the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when I saw him, I said to myself, this is the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does this mean? That somebody pointed out, he said, that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abu Rimsa said, when I saw him, I said, this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which means, he could feel the Prophet's presence. He could uh, observe from him that this person has to be a Prophet. That's why Sayyidina Ka'b radiallahu anhu said, uh, if Allah did not bestow upon the Prophet any other miracle, then his appearance would have sufficed as a miracle to say that he is the true Prophet. His appearance would have sufficed. So that's another reason that when we study the appearance and the features of the Prophet wasallam, in reality we are studying the miracles of Islam, the miracles by which we prove the, the truthfulness of our religion. This is the Prophet of Allah. He was wearing two green garments. He was wearing two green garments. And he had some hairs that had turned white but were red. Okay, in this narration, this narration can be read in two ways. And that is, uh, he said, I was shown the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This phrase in Arabic can be read in two ways. It could be read, it could mean, I was shown him, meaning by his companions and they informed me about him. Or it could mean, I showed him, meaning he showed his son, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and introduced him to the apparent signs of his prophethood while also exposing him to his noble character for outer appearance is an indicator of what is treasured within one's innermost self one of the companions proclaimed were there not within him evident signs his form would have be would have conveyed to you the news thereof so in this narration uh, abu rimsa he says I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with a son of mine Qala fa'araytuhu And then he said fa'araytuhu This word fa'araytuhu The scholars have said This could have two meanings Number one That the Prophet's companions showed me The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And that's what we mentioned first Or the second meaning could be That my son was with me And I showed him Who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was And both are beautiful meanings the first is that companions are introducing him to the Prophet Sallallahu which we spoke about. And the second is also an extremely beautiful meaning, and that is that he bought his son and he said, that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Introducing him to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also, when he said, this is the Prophet of Allah, this statement was without any pondering or delay, which means, I immediately knew him to be the Prophet of Allah from the light of his beautiful countenance and the clarity of his perfection, such that there was no need for the appearance of any other miracle. 
Then at the end, he was wearing two green garments. This could mean that they were completely green, as are most of the clothes of the people of paradise, or it could mean that it's his garment had green lines in it. And finally, and he had some hairs that had turned white but were red. Some hairs that were white but had turned red. What does this mean? In his Sunan al-Kubra, Imam al-Bayhaqi recorded a similar narration from Abu Rimsa with more details. Abu Rimsa reported, I went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam along with my father. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met us on the road. My father asked me, dear son, do you know who this man is that is approaching? No, I replied. He said, this is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he said that, I began to tremble. Allahu Akbar. He said, when my father said, this is the Messenger of Allah, he said, I began to tremble. And that was because I saw one who bore no resemblance to any other human being. Rather, he was a man whose blessed hair reached his earlobes with traces of hina in it, wearing two green garments. So what does that mean now? So in this narration, Abu Rimsa is saying that he saw some hairs of the Prophet wasallam that had turned white but were red. What does this mean? That there were some white hairs that the Prophet ﷺ dyed as red. He, he applied henna and they changed into red color. Now, when somebody applies henna and the white hair become red or any other color, then after some time what happens is that color begins to fade away. When it begins to fade away, it starts to fade away generally at the roots first. It generally fades away at the roots first. So you can have one hair that could have been red and white at the same time. So he said, uh, and he had some hair that had turned white but were red. Which means that he is indicating that the Prophet ﷺ applied henna to his hair. The next narration, عن سماك بن حرب قال قيل لجابر بن سمرة أكان في رأس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم شيب قال لم يكن في رأس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم شيب إلا شعرات في مفرقه إذا الدهن وارهن الدهن Jabir ibn Samura was asked Did the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم have any white hair on his head? He replied the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have any white hair on his blessed head except for a few strands in the middle where it would be parted. And if he applied oil to his blessed head, the oil would conceal them. So he noticed that in the mafraq, which is the parting where the Prophet Sallallahu would part his hair in the middle, he noticed some white hairs there. And he mentioned them. But then he said, if he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam applied oil, then even they would be concealed and would not be seen. They would only be seen when his blessed hair would be dry and without having applied oil to his blessed head sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Babu ma jaa fi khidabi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What has been narrated concerning the dye of the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So We notice The shaykh he started with which chapter The ch third chapter The third chapter was regarding his blessed hair Then The fourth chapter was his combing of the hair The fifth chapter was His blessed white hair And now the sixth chapter Is regarding the dye of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an iyad ibn laqit qal akhbarani abu rimsah qala ataytu an nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ma ibn li fa qal ibnuka hadha fa qultu na'am ashhadu bihi qala la yajni alayka wa la tajni alayhi qala wa ra'aytu ash-shayba ahmar abu rimsah reported 
I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with one of my sons and he asked, is this your son? I replied, yes. I, I acknowledge him. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will not be held accountable for his crime, nor will he be held accountable for your crime. I saw some white hairs that had been dyed red. So in this narration, uh, we find the original Arabic of this phrase can be read in two ways. Number one, as a present tense verb meaning I acknowledge him. Or number two, as a command verb. And when addressing the Prophet wasallam, it is not a command verb as such, but rather a request, meaning bear witness that, that he is indeed my son. So when the Prophet ﷺ asked, is this your son? The man replied and said, yes. And then he said, I acknowledge him. I acknowledge him, which is a present tense verb. This is one of the meanings. And the other meaning from the Arabic phrase is, the man is saying to the Prophet ﷺ, Messenger of Allah, I request to you that you acknowledge him as my son. I you affirm for me that he is my son. Even though the man knew he is my son, why is he saying this to the Prophet ﷺ? To take from the blessings of the Prophet ﷺ that the Prophet is saying, this is your son. That the Prophet is affirming, this is your son. This is your belonging. Shaykh Mustafa Turkumani, rahmatullah alayhi, he said, Kullu nasi majanin. He said, all people are mad. And he said, the people of Allah are mad in his love and he, the love of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Look at the Sahaba. Just, we wouldn't even imagine saying these things. If somebody came to you with his son and you, that person, you ask that person, is this your son? You say, yes, I acknowledge this is my son. You wouldn't say to the other person, you acknowledge him for me. But look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Look at how great they took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They would say, Messenger of Allah, acknowledge him as my son. You know what that means? That means Messenger of Allah, if you don't acknowledge him to be my son, I'll give up on him too. <coughs> I'll give up on him too. I won't acknowledge him. Like Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, when his son said to him, his son was yet not Muslim, and he attended a battle against the Muslims. And he saw his father amongst the Muslims. And he moved away. Later on when he accepted Islam, he said to his father, he said, Father, in that battle, you came right before my sword, but I walked away from you. So I can't, I can't do this, this is my father. Even though we're, we're on opposite sides. What did Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh say? He said, had you come before my sword once, you wouldn't be standing here today. He said, had you come before my sword once, you wouldn't be standing here today. Which means, if the Prophet doesn't acknowledge you, I don't acknowledge you. If you're not for the Prophet, you're not for me. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when he said, well, uh, uh, if, if, if they were instructed, Allah said in the Quran, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْ اقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ أَوْ اِخْرُجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ مَا فَعَلُوهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ فَعَلُوا مَا يُعَظُونَ بِهِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ وَأَشَدَّ تَثْبِيتًا وَإِذَا لَآتَيْنَاهُمْ مِنْ لَدُنَّا أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا وَلَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ صِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا Allah said in the Quran وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ If we were to prescribe for them, i.e. the believing people, if we were to prescribe and instruct them to do this, and what's that? أَنِقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ For them to kill themselves. أَوِخْرُجُوا مِن دِيَارِكُمْ or for them to leave, give up on their homes and leave them. Allah said, if, Allah didn't instruct it, Allah said, if Allah was in, to instruct them to kill themselves or to leave out from their homes, ma fa'aluhu illa qalilun minhum. Not many of them would have done that. Not many of them would have done that. When Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anh had this verse, he came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, 
Messenger of Allah, if you instruct me to kill myself, I'll kill myself immediately. And the Prophet said, Sadaqta, you spoke the truth and you would do that. When Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh heard this verse, he said, Messenger of Allah, if you instruct me, I would do it immediately. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in my ummah, there are people whose iman is stronger than the mountains, referring to the iman of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh. One day, the, the son of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, he showed a discomfort towards Dubba. Uh, a particular food that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would enjoy and like. He showed a discomfort towards that. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu an said to him, how dare you show a discomfort towards a food that is beloved to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when this companion came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the Prophet said, Ibn Kahada, is this your son? What, what else do we notice? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the greatest of the great. But when a child came into his presence, he didn't just give attention to the adults, he would ask about the children too. And that's a trait and a prophetic quality that we need to adopt. We need to uh, adopt and we need to pick up. We shouldn't overlook children. We shouldn't brush them aside. We should give concern to them. We should give due attention to them because they are the growing flowers of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ibn Kahaza, this is your son? Is this your son? He said, Naam, this is my son. And then he said, Messenger of Allah, acknowledge him for me. I, if you affirm him that he is my son, then, then it's stamped that he is my son. Then he said, in, in saying, you will not be held accountable for his crime, nor will he be held accountable for your crime. The Prophet ﷺ was assuring Abu Rimtha that the pre-Islamic practice of taking the father to account for the crimes of the son was null and that the people and that people are only held liable for their own crimes in another narration he stated the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited the verse and none shall bear the burden of others wala taziru waziratun wizra ukhra what does that mean that means every person is responsible for themselves when a child becomes uh, mature that child is responsible for his or her own actions before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, what did he say at the end? وَرَأَيْتُ الشَّيْبَ أَحْمَرْ And he said, I saw some white hairs that had been dyed red. I saw some white hairs that had been dyed red. What do we notice here? We notice that the man came to speak about his encounter with the Prophet sallallahu he said, I came to the Prophet Sallallahu either the Sahaba showed him who the Prophet was or he showed his son who the Prophet was and then this, the Prophet Sallallahu asked about his son and that's really the greatest thing that can happen to a father that the Prophet asks you, is this your son? But then what does the companion further notice and record and register for the rest of us? He said, and I noticed that some of his hair was dyed. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read Qala Abu Isa Hadha Ahsanu Shayin Ruya Fi Hadha Al-Babi Wa Afsar Imam Al-Tirmidhi Radiyallahu An narrates This is the best and most explanatory narration in this chapter for the rigorously authenticated narration state that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not reach the point of needing dye for his blessed white hairs Abu Rimtha uh, Abu Rimtha's name is Rifa'a Ibn Yathribi At-Taymi But the next narration An Usman ibn Mawhabin Qala su'ila Abu Hurayrata Hal khadaba Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallama Qala na'am Sayyidina Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu was asked, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam use dye? He replied, yes. Qala Abu Isa, uh, Abu Awana narrated this hadith on the authority of Uthman ibn Abdullah 
Ibn Mawhab, who said that he related it on the authority of Umm Salama. The next narration, Anil Jahzamati Imrati Bishr ibn al Khasasiya. قالت أنا رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يخرج من بيته ينفض رأسه وقد اغتسل وبرأسه ردع من حناء قال أو أو قال ردع شك في هذا الشيخ I saw the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم leave his home while shaking water from his blessed head he had just taken a bath and on his blessed head were traces ردع of حناء dye or he said, Radr, the Shaykh was unsure, i.e. the narrator was unsure of which word it was Radr or Radr. But the narration is that he left his blessed home and his noble hair was still wet from bathing. And this companion said uh, that they no, uh, uh, noticed that there was uh, traces of Hinna that were still on the noble head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next narration أنبأنا حميد عن أنس قال رأيت شعر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مخضوبا قال حماد وأخبرنا عبد الله بن محمد بن عقيل قال رأيت شعر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عند أنس بن مالك مخضوبا حميد informed us on the authority of Anas رضي الله عنه reported I saw the blessed hair of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and it was dyed Ahmad said, Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Aqil related to us, I saw the blessed hair of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam with Anas ibn Malik and it was dyed. So when was this? This was after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had left this world. Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, he had some blessed hairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And occasionally when he would have visitors, he would take those out and he would show them to his visitors. And this particular visitor, uh, Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Aqil, he said, I saw the, the hair of the Prophet ﷺ with Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik and they had been dyed with hinna, i.e. previously, and that dye color was still on them. What do we notice here? We notice, uh, of course, that the companion is informing us that the blessed hair of the Prophet ﷺ was dyed, this is one. And number two, the fact that Sayyidina Anas kept the hair of the Prophet ﷺ. And number three, he also showed that hair to others, so others could also take blessings from the blessed hair of the Prophet ﷺ. No. And the scholars of Hadith, they differed whether the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually dyed his hair or he didn't. Some said that he did dye his hair. The, the, the amounts of hair that went white, that he dyed them. Others said that he didn't dye them. Now, why is this? Why do we have conflicting narrations? The reason we have conflicting narrations is because there were some companions who saw him whilst his hair wasn't dyed and others saw him when his hair was dyed. And it's possible, and like the narration where he said that the hair was white but red, which means that person might have seen a combination of both within the hair. So there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars whether he dyed his hair or not, 
but we find some narration saying that he did dye his hair and other narration saying that he didn't dye his blessed hair sallallahu alaihi wasallam inshallah we'll stop there um, from uh, the recitation of the hadith and we'll just uh, speak a few moments about uh, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar so Sheikh Nuruddin Itar who is known as the Muhaddis of Asham he was originally from the city of Aleppo Halab which is in the north of Syria and he descends from a Hassani family his lineage goes back to Sayyiduna Hassan Ibn Ali radiallahu an through his father uh, as Sheikh Muhammad Itar his father Sheikh Muhammad Itar was a very pious righteous man who was a very close student of Sheikh Najib Sirajuddin Al Husseini radiallahu an. Sheikh Najib Sirajuddin Al Husseini radiallahu an was one of the greatest scholars of hadith uh, and Hanafi jurisprudence in the city of Aleppo, in the city of Halab. So Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, the Muhaddis of Asham, rahmatullah ali, his lineage from his father traced back to Sayyiduna Al Hassan. Ibn Ali radiallahu an and his lineage from his mother traced back to Sayyiduna al Hussein radiallahu an so he was a Sayyid of Hassani and Husseini descent both from his father and from his mother so he was Sharif from both sides he was a Sayyid from both sides of his parents as for his mother she was the only daughter of Sheikh Najib Sirajuddin radiallahu anhu. Sheikh Najib Sirajuddin was one of the greatest scholars of hadith and Hanafi jurisprudence and one of the greatest awliya Allah of his time. And her brother was the great Imam and scholar of hadith and lover of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin al Husseini radiallahu anhu. So Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, his mother was the daughter of Sheikh Najib and his uh, mother's brother his uncle from his mother's side was the great scholar of hadith Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin al Husseini radiallahu an and Sheikh Nuruddin Itar was also married to his cousin i.e. the daughter of Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin al Husseini radiallahu an Sheikh Nuruddin Itar was born in 1937 in the city of Aleppo uh, and that's where he uh, began his early studies in the 50s, he went to Al-Azhar al-Sharif and he studied with some of the giants of Al-Azhar al-Sharif. And in the 50s, he graduated from Al-Azhar al-Sharif, taking the first position from amongst all of, the, of his year. And I remember one of my teachers, uh, I think it was Sheikh Muhammad Darwish, who was a senior student of Sheikh Nuruddin Itar. Uh, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, he had many of his students were of very, very, very senior scholars. Myself, I didn't formally study with Sheikh Nuruddin Itar. I attended some of his open uh, lessons in Hadith. But many of my teachers were very senior students of Sheikh Nuruddin Itar. Amongst them, I think it was Sheikh Muhammad Darwish, if I can remember correctly, who told us, that when Sheikh Nuruddin Itar told them that when he was in Al Azhar al Sharif studying in the 50s, he would study all year round. He wouldn't wait for the exam days to come for him to sit down and revise and memorize. He would study all year round. So when the days of examination would come, he didn't really need to revise. But what he would do is he would open up his book and pretend to revise so that he is not struck with evil eye and his other fellow students think he didn't even study and he got the marks, right? So he was a very hard working student from his early days of his studies uh, in, uh, in Al-Azhar. When he returned from Al-Azhar, uh, he began to teach in the universities, uh, in the University of Damascus. He started first in the University of Damascus. Then he had the honor of teaching in the university in Madinatul Munawwara. And there he resided in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, taking up close proximity to his grandfather Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in the early 60s, he was appointed a lecturer at the university in Madinatul Munawwara. After that, he returned back to Damascus 
and he was a lecturer in Hadith and in Quran studies, both in the University of Damascus and the University of Aleppo. And then later on, in the uh, University of Umdurman and University of Al Azhar and the University of uh, Bilad al Sham. So there were many, many universities where he was a lecturer within Damascus. And the Shaykh produced over 50 works in Hadith studies and Quran studies. Uh, and some of his works are uh, groundbreaking works in Hadith studies, in that uh, there was certain understanding in the science of hadith or certain organization of books of hadith that was perhaps not put together in a book the way Shaykh Nuruddin Itar did. And he had the honor of, uh, of, uh, of editing some of the very important uh, works of hadith. Uh, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, he was, he was, he was a scholar, and he was a very serious scholar. He was a very serious scholar. One of my teachers, Sheikh Riyad Al Khiraqi, rahmatullah Ali, who was a scholar of Hadith, was Sheikh Nuruddin's very senior student. Right, and I remember when I was in Damascus, and my teacher Sheikh Riyad Al Khiraqi. And uh, others, like our teacher, Sheikh Muhammad Matrahaji Al Qadri from Madinat Al Munawwara, was studying uh, their masters, and Sheikh Nuruddin was their teacher. They would tell us of how the examinations of Sheikh Nuruddin Itar are extremely difficult. They were extremely difficult. If you saw Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, you'd think his exams will be easy. But if you sat in a class with him, you wouldn't say that ever again, <laughs> right? So he was a very, very serious scholar who wanted to produce very serious students. One day a, a student came to him and said, Shaykh, can I have ijazah in hadith? And the Shaykh said to him, what have you memorized in hadith? And he said, nothing. He said, what do you want a certificate in? He said, go and memorize Riyadh al-Saliheen and perhaps then you will be eligible to have a certificate. Like that, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, he revived in Damascus the notion of memorization of books of hadith. When I left Damascus, there was about 28 female students, this was in 2006, 28 female students who had memorized all of Bukhari and Muslim at the hand of Sheikh Nuruddin Itar. And after that, many, many, many more memorized the books of hadith with Sheikh Nuruddin Itar. Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, uh, he was a very humble man. And you could see signs of humility and humbleness upon him all the time. I witnessed him twice on the streets of Damascus. You know, when you hear about a scholar this, this great, you expect that he won't be walking around in the streets. But I witnessed him with my own eyes twice. Once in the city set center of Damascus, I went to exchange some money. I came out of the money exchange, and there and behold, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar was walking past. He had his briefcase, and his head was down like this. And I thought of giving him salam, but I couldn't move from my place. So I just watched on as the Sheikh tread along. And I noticed that he wasn't picking up his foot from the ground. He was just pulling himself along upon the ground. The servants of the most merciful, they walk upon the earth with such ease. He wouldn't even pick up his foot. This, I saw this with my own eyes. He was just doing this his feet, with his shoes, with his feet and moving along. And his head was down and he had his own briefcase in his hand and walking along. This was one of the times, and this time I didn't give him salam. I just stood there and observed him. Observed his humility and his humbleness and his brokenness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another time uh, I was uh, on, walking on this bridge, I can't remember his name. 
beneath this bridge there was a, a, a bus station where all the buses would stop. So I must have got off from the buses and walking up the bridge and I sh saw the Sheikh there. So this time I actually gave him salam and I walked along with him for a few moments. But again, with his briefcase in his hand and his head dropped towards the ground. And other times, uh, some of the really, really impressive moments of my life that I saw in a scholar were in Sheikh Nuruddin Atar. And that was that when he would teach hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, every time the name of the Prophet ﷺ would be mentioned, his eyes would close and become tearful. And you know what? I used to read uh, that uh, people like Imam Malik radiallahu an, when the name of the Prophet sallallahu used to be mentioned, they would go pale. You would see that in Shaykh Nuruddin Atr. When he would sit in a lesson of hadith, his color would change, he would become pale. Right? He was a man of uh, hadith, a man of knowledge, and some of his senior students, they say that he was a person who had all of the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence in his mind. Not only that, but all of the evidences of every school in every matter, whether it's in worship or transaction or business, whatever it was, he had everything in his mind because of the rigorous study that he did in his young days and he continued to do throughout his life. And uh, Sheikh Nuruddin Itar, when he speaks about himself, he says, one of the people who really built my personality was my uncle and my teacher, Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin al Husseini, radiallahu an. He said, and Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin al Husseini, radiallahu an, was no normal scholar. I heard Sheikh Nuruddin Itar say about him that he, it was justified for the Ummah to call him Sheikh al Islam. It was justified for the Ummah to call him Shaykh al-Islam. And this title of Shaykh al-Islam, it's a title that was only ever given to a very, very few individuals in the history of Islam. And I heard from Shaykh, Shaykh Nuruddin Itar say about him that uh, Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin began to teach in the lifetime of his own father. And when people heard the knowledge of the son, some people began to say he is more knowledgeable than his father. And he never used to like for people to say that and he never used to like to hear that. But Sheikh Nuruddin Itar said, you can see the caliber of this person. That was the teacher of Sheikh Nuruddin Itar. So when you have a teacher like that, who is extremely engaged in study, in worship, and, and the very senior students of Sheikh Nuruddin Itar say that it wasn't only during the day that Sheikh Nuruddin was engaged. But even during the depths of the night, he would stand for long periods before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in tahajjud. And that's a sign of a true scholar who not only adopts the daytime of the Prophet sallallahu but also the night of the Prophet sallallahu Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the Prophet sallallahu to stand at night. Allah said, Inna nashi'at al-layli hiya ashaddu wat'an wa aqwa muqila." Allah mentions the standing of the night and the glorification and worship of the day. Shaykh Nuruddin Itar, he left behind over 50 works in hadith studies, in Quran studies, and in various disciplines of Islam. But alongside that, he left behind giants in knowledge students. Giants. When I say giants, I mean giants. And he, because I, I, I know this, the people who would study with him, I, I met them, I studied with them, and they told me that he was a very serious scholar who wanted to produce very serious students. And therefore, amongst a class of 20, perhaps only two would pass his exams. That's no exaggeration. Amongst a class of 20, only two would pass their exams with Shaykh Nuruddin Atar. Why? Because he wanted the best of the best. And he wanted the highest level of quality to come out from his students so that they could carry on with his legacy and with the legacy of Islam after him. And 
the scholars have said, the one who leaves behind never dies. Man khallaf ma mat. The one who leaves behind never dies. Sheikh Nuruddin Aitar left behind scholars who spread across the world and he left behind works and books. And the difference between Sheikh Nuruddin Aitar's works, written works, and perhaps that of others is his actual writings and works became textbooks in universities. His works are textbooks that are taught in universities across the Muslim world. Whether it's in Hadith, whether it's in Quran studies, they are not just normal books, but rather textbooks. And the caliber of his writing is not from our age. The caliber of his writing is from the age of the early scholars of Hadith. From the caliber of the early scholars of Hadith. And we have to remember our scholars, not only when they have left this world, but whilst they are alive, we should strive to meet them, to visit them, to study with them, to be close to them, to pick up from their company, to study their works, to read their books, to find their students and to sit with them. And not only be a people who remember them once they've gone, even that is a duty upon us that we don't forget our scholars. Because by us uh, remembering them is showing our loyalty unto them, our appreciation for what they did, but also it demonstrates that we are people who are connected unto righteousness and piety and knowledge. And that's very, very important. Like the poet said, if you want me to tell you who you are, then tell me about who your companions are. If you want me to tell you who you are, then tell me about who your companions are, and then I'll tell you exactly who you are. So if somebody accompanies the righteous, uh, somebody accompanies the righteous and the scholars and the people of Allah and the people of knowledge and the people of wisdom, then of course the caliber of that person who accompanies them will also become great. And that's why we need to upgrade ourselves from uh, always upgrade ourselves and try to better ourselves. And one of the ways of bettering ourselves is to be in the company of the righteous scholars. And we have to be, we have to take this matter seriously because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Inna Allah la yaqbilul ilma intizaa." Allah doesn't take, Allah doesn't lift knowledge by stripping it all at once. وَلَكِنْ يَقْبِضُهُ بِمَوْتِ الْعُلَمَاء But rather Allah takes knowledge by the death of scholars. By the death of the true righteous scholars of Allah. The true righteous people of Allah, of scholarship. When they die, knowledge goes with them. We may think in our time, we have access to knowledge like no other era, no other time before us. Yes, we do. But is that access to knowledge of any benefit? Not in most times. Why? Because knowledge is not only that which is in between the lines and on the pages written in ink. Like the early people would say, innamal ilmu laysa ilmu fi suturi innamal ilmu fi suduri Knowledge is not that which is in the lines, it's that which is in the hearts. Our tradition and knowledge is a transmission of a state of hearts that is delivered unto another people. That is delivered unto another people. So when the, when the ulama, the true righteous ulama, when they die, it's as if they have taught, taken an enormous portion of knowledge with them. And that's what should frighten us, that we should take the opportunity of them, finding them, sitting with them, learning from them, whilst they are still alive. Because once they have gone, a lot of knowledge will also go. Even if we've got it in books, the reality of knowledge is in these living embodiments of Islam. That's the beauty of our religion. It's, it can be visualized in living embodiments. And who are those living embodiments? They are the scholars of Islam. Shaykh Nuruddin Aitar rahmatullahi alayhi, he passed away a few, days ago, a few days ago in Damascus. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise his ranks in the highest abodes of Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue his benefit uh, until the day of judgment through his works, through his students. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us benefit 
through his state, through his knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join us on with the righteous people and the righteous scholars in this world. And on the day of standing, Ya Rabbil Alameen wa Ya Arhaman Rahimeen. Another one of the scholars, he passed away also a few days ago in Madinatul Munawwara, Sheikh Abdul Wakil, who was also a very early graduate of our school, Al Fatul Islami. Uh, he passed away two days ago and he was buried in Jannatul Baqi' in Madinatul Munawwara. And today I heard that his wife passed away. Both husband and wife passed away uh, about a day or two after each other and both are buried in Madinatul Munawwara. That's Allah's doings, isn't it? صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه اجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك Oh Allah, we ask you that you have mercy upon the scholars of Islam who have gone from this world, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, have mercy upon our teachers, our educators, our nurturers. Oh Allah, in particular, our teacher, Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Halabi, Sheikh Adib Al-Kallas, and those who they took from and those who took from them, and the Muhaddis of Sham, Sheikh Nur al-Din Atr, Sheikh Abdul Wakil and his wife, and all of the righteous people of Allah who have left from this world, O oh Allah, illuminate their graves, raise their ranks, and grant them companionship and neighborhood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the highest abodes of Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we, 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 we take you as a witness, and all of your angels as a witness, and the, the carriers of the throne as a witness, that we love all of them for your sake. O oh Allah, we ask you to benefit us through this love in this world, in our graves, and on the day of standing, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we love these righteous people, these pious people, these people of knowledge, people of consciousness, piety, goodness. O oh Allah, we ask you that you bless us with the blessings of piety, righteousness, consciousness, and knowledge, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we love these people for your sake. O oh Allah, we ask you that you bless us through this love, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, forgive us by means of these righteous people, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you have mercy upon this Ummah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make us steadfast upon this religion. O oh Allah, keep us away from the whisperings of the self and the whisperings of the shaitan, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Protect us and protect our offsprings until the day of judgment from the shaitan, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Make us and our offsprings until the day of judgment steadfast upon this religion, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, don't let any of us deviate from this religion and know from our offsprings until the day of judgment, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, make us people of guidance, make us people of goodness, make, make us people of righteousness, make us people of piety, make us people of worship, make us people of goodness, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you bless the righteous scholars who have passed away, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And those who are still alive, O oh Allah, we ask you, that you extend in their lives with good health and well-being, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And allow us to benefit from them wherever they are, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, allow us to travel to them, to find them, to sit with them, to take benefit from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you for the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask you that you give us obedience to him and you make us a people who imitate him and reflect him in all of our affairs, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you to make this world, belittle this world in our hearts, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and magnify the Akhirah in our hearts, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you to belittle the, the gains of this world in our hearts and in our eyes, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and to magnify the gains and the, the, uh, what is to come in the Akhirah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata a'yinu wa ja'alna lilmuttaqina imama. Rabbana aghfir lana wa liikhwanina alladhina sabakuna bil iman. ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار والبصائر وضيائها وقوة الأرواح وغذائها وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل صلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل به العقد وتنفرج به الكرب وتقضى به الحوائج وتنال به الرغائب وحسن الخواتيم ويستسقى الغمام بنور وجهه العظيم وعلى آله وصحبه حق قدره ومقداره العظيم 
سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون سلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن شاء الله we'll pray Aisha if you stay in your places we'll pray Aisha إن شاء الله